Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Savior's Lutheran Church Summer Worship, Summer Simple Worship, Simply Worship in the Summer. This morning I'm, uh, I'm kind of calling it a good news service. The uh, version of the Bible that we'll read the lessons from this morning is that good news version that was kind of published in the middle 70s, and so the songs we'll be using this morning too are kind of published and written at about that same time frame. So the good news service this morning. Hope you enjoy it and can praise God in this time today. I'm Pastor Chris Hill, senior pastor here at Our Saviors. And on behalf of the rest of the staff and Brad on organ, it is my joy to welcome you here in person or if you're listening on the radio or watching on Cat7 YouTube or Facebook. However you are experiencing this service, it is the intent of your leadership to make it obvious and true that this time we spend together is totally inclusive. Everybody's welcome here, and it's totally in unconditionally inclusive. But there are some things that get in the way of living into to fully living into that welcome. There are forces that deliberately align or randomly assail us as the followers of Jesus, both individually and then that assail us as community as well. Those forces would block and hamper our fully living into that promise of God. They would block us from fully keeping those promises with and for each other, fully enjoying God's consolations. And here's the deal, and this is what we get to celebrate today. Jesus has already provided the remedy for that. We are here to celebrate that wonder. We are here to worship the God who sends that Christ into this world. We are here to sing praise. So as you are able, would you rise together with me for our gathering song, Day by Day. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Seeking reconciliation with God and neighbor, let us remember the gift of baptism and confess our sin. God of mercy. We confess that we have sinned against you, against one another, and against the earth entrusted to our care. We are worried and distracted by many things, and we fail to love you above all else. We store up treasures for ourselves and turn away from our neighbors in need. Forgive us that we may live in the freedom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. When we are laid low by sin and guilt, God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving us all our trespasses by taking our sins to the cross. 
For freedom Christ has set us free. Rejoice in this good news. Amen. Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life within you and Christ's presence in your midst. Our eyes shall be open. The present will have a new meaning and the future will be bright with hope. Pray with me. O oh Lord God, we bring before you the cries of a sorrowing world. In your mercy, set us free from the chains that bind us and defend us from everything that is evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah 65, verses 1 through 9. The prophet announces God's impatience. The people's self-absorption is idolatry, and images from pagan worship fill this reading. Like a vinter who crushes the grape to release the wine, God will use Israel's exile to establish a new community of the faithful. The Lord said, I was ready to answer my people's prayers, but they did not pray. I was ready for them to find me, but they did not even try. The nation did not pray to me, even though I was always ready to answer, here I am, I will help you. I've always been ready to welcome my people who stubbornly do what is wrong and go their own way. They shamelessly keep on making me angry. They offer pagan sacrifices at sacred gardens and burn incense on pagan altars. At night, they go to caves and tombs to consult the spirits of the dead. They eat pork and drink from broth made from meat offered in pagan sacrifices. And then they say to others, keep away from us. We are too holy for you to touch. I cannot stand people like that. My anger against them is like a fire that never goes out. I have already decided on their punishment and their sentence is written down. I will not overlook what they have done, but will repay them for their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They have burned incense at pagan hill shrines and spoken evil of me. So I will punish them as their past deeds deserve. The Lord says, no one destroys good grapes. Instead, they make wine with them. Neither will I destroy all my people. I will save those who serve me. I will bless the Israelites who belong to the tribe of Judah, and their descendants will possess my land of mountains. My chosen people who serve me will live there. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is Galatians 3, 23 to 29. For Paul, baptism is a powerful bond that unites people not only with God, but with other believers. Those who call themselves children of God experience a transformation that removes prejudices of race, social class, or gender in favor of true unity in Christ. But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came in order that we might be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. It is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus. You were baptized into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Word of God, word of life. Amen. 
As we prepare for the reading of the gospel story, the story of Jesus, would you rise together? We're back into the, the gospel of Luke. After spending some time with Jesus and the disciples in the gospel of John just before his, his crucifixion, we're back into the main stories, the, the scope and the sweep of the stories of Jesus' life for these next weeks here in Pentecost. And we're back in the gospel the way Luke tells it. The story just before this, Jesus and his disciples, Jesus had said, let's go to the other side of the lake. And the other side of the lake, they were in Galilee, the other side of the lake is, is, is pagan territory. It's Gentile territory. So why he wanted to go, we're not really sure. But on the way, that they encounter a storm. The, the boat they're in almost capsizes, is almost washed away. But Jesus calms the storm. And his disciples go, who is this then that can even calm the waves? And then they get to shore, and we find out who this is. Luke 8. And we find out from an unlikely source. Luke 8, 26 to 39. Jesus and his disciples sailed over to the territory of Gerasera, which is across the lake from Galilee. And as Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a man from that town who had demons in him. For a long time, this man had gone without clothes and wouldn't stay home, but spent his time in the burial caves. The exact kind of thing, just a little aside here, the exact kind of thing that the first lesson said, don't do that. It makes God angry. So when this demoniac, this man inhabited by demons, saw Jesus, he gave a loud cry, threw himself down at Jesus' feet, and shouted, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? I beg you, don't punish me. And he said this because Jesus had ordered the evil spirits to go out of him many times. Those spirits had seized this man, and even though he was kept a prisoner, his hands and feet tied with chains, he would break the chains and be driven by the demon out into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Mob, he answered. My name is Legion. My name is Many, because many demons had gone into him. And the demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. There was a large herd of pigs nearby feeding on the hillside. Jewish people don't hang out with pigs. You need to know that too. There was a large herd of pigs nearby feeding on the hillside. So the demons begged at Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he let them. And they went out of the man and into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The men who had been taking care of the pigs saw what happened, and they ran off and spread the news in the town and among the farms in the area. And people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were all afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the man had been cured. Then all the people from that territory asked Jesus to go away. They begged him to go away because they were terribly afraid. So Jesus got into the boat and left. And the man from whom the demons had gone out begged him, let me go with you. But Jesus sent him back, saying, go back and tell what God has done for you. And so the man went through his town telling what Jesus had done for him. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. The youngest folk, if you would come up and gather for this morning's children's sermon. Let's kind of gather over here. There we go. All right. Come on up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I need to ask you a question this morning. Has, do you notice, did you notice this morning if God, God did anything for you today? Hmm. How about this? Are you awake? All right. Did your parents or grandparents or somebody like wake you up? You did it all by yourself? Cool. All right. I believe that that's, you are awake today 
no matter who actually poked you or opened your window or when I was a little kid, my mom would, would go into my room when I was still asleep. She would say, good morning, in kind of the most annoying voice, and then open the window to my, no matter how cold it was outside, she'd open the window and say, hey, let's go, and yeah. That, that was supposed to get me up. Well, but see, what happens is, is I think God is really the one who gets us up. So if you are awake today, God did that. And I think if some God did something for you, it's always a good idea to thank God for it and tell other people. I think, are you alive today? Just checking it. Everybody alive? Can you feel your heartbeat? You're breathing? Yeah, I think God did that too. And so it's always a good idea when God does something for us to thank God for it and tell others how awesome it really is. Let's see. Now maybe you can start to think of other things that maybe God did for you. Did you have breakfast before you came today? No? You're going to have lunch though? Probably. Yeah. I think God did that too. So it's really an awesome thing to go, yeah, thank you God for breakfast and for lunch and for food and for people who wake me up and for the breath that I have and to tell others that God has done that too. Jesus offers to help you notice those things all the time. So when something really good happens or, or even just something normal happens and God did it, you can go, oh, thank you, God, for the rain or for the fun I had yesterday or for our plans for tomorrow. And you can tell people, yeah, God loved me. That's an awesome thing. Whenever God does good things, it's always a good thing to remember to thank God for it and to tell others that it's true. So in just a little bit, we're going to pray in a second. But in just a little bit, I'm going to talk about some things that stop us from doing that, that stop us from going, thank you, and stop us from telling other people that God did that good things for us. So I hope you keep listening. But in the meantime, let's pray. Can you repeat after me? Thank you, God, for waking me up and giving me breath and all that you do. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Oh, look at that. I was wondering where that went. This is the certificate I talked about last week for that we got from the Synod that said that we gave $12.14 per confirmed member to World Hunger this year because of Rejoice Renew Reach. I was wondering where that went. Oh, and by the way, God did that, too. There we go. So I promised the youngsters that we talk about the things that get in the way of us recognizing that God is doing things and of, that gets in the way of us thanking God for doing things in our lives and the things that get in the way of us telling others that God is good. Martin Luther, when he explains to us what's going on in the Lord's Prayer, helps us pin, pin the tail on the donkey of the problem, the devil, the world, and our sinful self. That is what Martin Luther says keeps us from saying thank you, keeps us from recognizing what God has done, and keeps us from telling others what God has done. Our Bible lessons this morning describe the effects of those powers, those forces on our souls and on our community. Those same lessons this morning reminded us of God's remedy and its grace. It's grace, it's God's gift of forgiveness, it's God's gift of strength. It's woven through the Isaiah prophecy, it's woven through what the missionary Paul was talking about, it's woven through the story of Jesus and the demon-filled man, grace. When we pray the prayer that Jesus teaches us, we pray that that grace, God's free gift of love and forgiveness, would take hold, or as Luther describes it, we ask in this prayer that we would keep God's name holy, that God's kingdom would come also to us, and that God's will would be done also among us. Luther goes on to describe that the creative life and breath of Jesus' words in his prayer teaches us that God's holiness, God's kingdom, God's will are done whenever he hinders and defeats the every evil scheme and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful self, which would prevent us 
from keeping his name holy and would oppose the coming of his kingdom or would keep us from recognizing the good that God has done and keep us from telling others about that and giving God thanks. When we pray, our Father in heaven, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Luther reminds us that God's will is done when God strengthens our faith and keeps us firm in his word as long as we live. That's the remedy. That's God at work. It's not so much about us. It's God's spirit breathing that life, that grace into us. That is grace. Isaiah's prophetic promise of God bringing forth descendants of God's people, he talks about it in terms of, you're going to be God's people. You're going to be these descendants of Israel. Remember, Israel, the Hebrew word that means the people who wrestle with God, the people who struggle with faith, the people who wrestle with life, with breath, and with love, with love itself. Israel, the one who wrestles with God. We are, all get to be descendants of that one particular person back in history that, that God encountered and taught what love really means. We all get to be descendants of the one that, that centuries ago God picked out and said, now you get to be the father of all these people and make sure that the world knows that what God does is what God does. And make sure that you teach the world how to, how to thank God for that and how to tell others about that. Abraham, whenever we, whenever we claim that being a child or a, or a son or a grandchild of Abraham, we're claiming that heritage. And Isaiah is saying that God makes that heritage real in us. Isaiah's prophetic promise of God bringing forth descendants of God's people and inheritors of God's realm is that grace in response to God's people wandering off to find where demons dwell, <laughs> wandering off into the tombs and into the caves of death, wandering off to where we think our human ways are more holy than God's ways, God's response is a warning and a promise, and both of those are grace. Missionary St. Paul's warnings for Christ's followers to focus on faith and grace instead of the law is that same advice restated, reminding us that it is in God's grace, it is in our baptism, it is in being re-clothed, re -re redressed, just like the man at Jesus' feet after the demons have been driven out, re-clothed, left off from our nakedness and given the, 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 the clothing that is Christ, the clothing that is love. The missionary St. Paul reminds us that as Christ's followers, we focus on faith and grace instead of the law. The devil, the world, and our sinful self will distract us into legalism. I don't wear these kinds of clothes. You've got to wear the right, you know. You notice that I'm not wearing my robes this morning. Okay, I'll put the stole on for communion. Got this cool t-shirt thing instead, you know. And it's not just because it's summer. That's the first excuse. But it's not about the clothes I wear. It's cool that you guys are wearing the robes, though, by the way. It's like, awesome. Okay, because you've know, you got work to do. And the communion servers are probably going to wear those. We'll see what happens. But it's not about the clothes that you wear. And it's not about, how, you know, it's not whether you call yourself a Lutheran or a Baptist. I had a little conversation with somebody on the, on the way in this morning. He goes, well, didn't I used to be a Baptist church across the street there? Yeah, it still is. They just don't name themselves that anymore. Lutheran churches have been doing kind of the same thing. It's like, oh, if we call ourselves Lutheran, people won't come. That's eh, not why they don't come. It's about the grace. It's about the love. It's about recognizing God at work. It's about understanding that it's God at work. It's about thanking God for God being at work. It's about telling others that God what God has done. We are clothed in Christ in our baptism. We are the family of God, part of the same family of God, chose to be the ones who thank God and tell others what God has done. Our mission as a congregation, writ large on the back wall, to know Christ and to have others know him is a, is a declaration of that same purpose. The devil and the world and our sinful selves throw up roadblocks to that mission. You walk by it most Sundays and maybe don't even notice it. That's the devil, the world, and our sinful self going, 
Never mind. Ignore that. Or never mind. Ignore that. I don't know. However you want to picture the demons at, at work in your life. But it's right there. And we encounter it as we leave because this in here is supposed to strengthen that in here out there. The devil, the world, and our sinful selves throw up the roadblocks to that mission. Evil divides us and distracts us. The junk of the world deadens and dilutes us. Our mistakes discourage and disappoint us. And when we don't notice God at work, and we don't thank God for what God has done, and we don't tell others what God has done. And when we baptize, we lay claim to the missionary St. Paul's reminder of the promise that comes from the water and the word. In that promise, we have the power to reject and renounce. And we say this in the baptismal service. If you were here last week when we did a baptism, and if you come next week, we're going to do a double, and you will hear these words where the, the families and, and the sponsors are asked to reject the devil, to renounce the devil and all of his empty promises, to renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, to renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God, to renounce the, power, the ways of sin that draw us from God. The grace is that in our baptism we are clothed with everything it takes to reject and renounce every power that would get in the way of that mission. The devil, the world, and our sinful self. Those forces would keep us from living lives of gratitude that are so abundant that just in living them, we are a witness to what God has done. Just in living them, there are thanksgiving to what God has done. Just in living them, there are declaration God is at work in this world. Jesus has come right into the force field of all evil and sin and driven those demons out no matter how big of a mob they might be, no matter how legion they might be, no matter how big of a group or how Im impressive they may feel in our lives, Jesus comes right into their, into their realm and says no. Jesus has come right into that force field of evil and sin and drew, driven those demons out. And then we can sit at Jesus' feet in our right minds, clothed in Christ in our baptism so that we can, right here, right now, proclaim throughout our city how much Jesus has done for us. We can do that through God's work, our hands. We can do that with Feed My Starving Children. We can do that with Habitat for Humanity. We can do that for the, with the offerings to Food Shelf and the Food Bank. We can, we can do that when we pray for each other in the midst of our grief. Russell passed. First service, he would sit right back there on his walker, usually first. So he had come once this summer, Sudden, suddenly died. A couple of weeks ago, we had his service. When we pray for his family, when we pray for his soul, when we pray for the people who love them, and when we're there for them to listen and to comfort and, and to just hear their stories, we are, we are proclaiming what God has done. We are remembering what God has done. We are telling the world what God has done. When we help with the Dominican and the Haiti and the Blue House missions, when we help with the ELCA World Hunger and we support the broader mission of Northeast Minnesota Synod and the ELCA, we are doing, we are doing, we are remembering, we are identifying what God has done. We are thanking God for what God has done and we are telling others. The devil, the world, our sinful self, those forces would keep us from recognizing who we are and what God has done. But we belong to Christ. We are the offspring of the family of Abraham. We are heirs according to the promise. We are the ones who sing songs of uh, praise and adoration so loud and so sweetly that the world will smile because of the voice and the melody 
And the song itself, as it creeps and seeps out from these walls into the very souls of a world in need. A song so loud and so sweet that the world will smile and see again how God has invited that whole world, that same world, all of us together, to bear the blessing and inherit God's holy kingdom. That is who we are. Don't let anything, anyone, any mob, any legion, any crowd distract you. Let's together sing a song of adoration. rise together with me to confess the faith that shapes that reality in our lives. The words are the words of the Apostles' Creed. They're ancient and they're true, and they help us focus what is true. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Thank you. Share that peace with each other. Remind each other of that power. Thank you for listening this morning. Thank you for opening your hearts and your minds and your ideas to the Word, to the sacrament. You are all welcome here at this table today. 
Thank you for being willing to come to this table to let the bread and the wine become in your lives the body and blood of Jesus. Thank you for responding to that love, to that grace, by being here, by sharing the peace with each other, by offering a little bit of yourselves in our offerings that will gather at this point. Thank you for being a part of the mission and ministry of this place and of these people. Thank you for telling others what God has done. Thank you for noticing what God has done. Thank you for thanking God for what God has done. Some things that God is doing in our midst in the weeks ahead. This coming Wednesday, this is beautiful rain. Thank you, God. It's beautiful rain today. We need it, but not on Wednesday, because Wednesday we're scheduled to have a picnic outside. If it rains, we'll go inside, but it's funner to do it outside. And then outdoor worship and with ice cream following. Um, just a gra great time to be together as God's people in, in our own yard here and witness to the world and worshiping outside. It's kind of a cool thing. 5.30 for the, for the picnic, 6.30 for worship, and ice cream right after that. I invite you to keep your eye on the entry area there. When Marty is out there and others are out there with their computer, they're there to help you um, update our directory, our electronic directory, so we can publish a printed copy of that. So keep your eye open for that. Um, we need a whole bunch more people to get their pictures submitted or taken or whatever and get that in there so that we can print a printed copy and, and uh, provide that to, uh, to you folks that need that. So you can also, with the app, if you're you know, cool on your phone, it's, it's supposed to work really good. It does. I've, I've got it uh, on my phone. Um, but it, it's, we're missing a bunch of people still. So it's not as quite yet as useful as it could be. So um, if you see Marty out there, I don't know if he's, he's going to make it today. But if he does, um, he, he's there to help you with that. And others will be too. I mentioned in the message, Russ passed away this week. Um, or we had his funeral this week. Uh, if you would keep his family in your prayers. You may notice in the bulletin that there's a, a funeral for, um, for Novak, that Sandy Novak. Um, they've been connected with our congregation for, for a great many of years. Um, that service on Saturday is a private service. It's um, for the family only. So, But if you would keep the Novak family in your prayers as well. Uh, the broth wagon for the Dominican scholarships will be coming again in July. The date has been on the uh, on the screens and will be for the next few weeks reminding us of that opportunity as well. So thank you for your kind attention. Would you rise together as your gifts are presented? Joining our voices with God's people around the world, let us offer our prayers for those in need. Blessed are you, O God, for the greening earth given for all, for the talents we are given to share, and for this bread and wine. Transform us to be the body of Christ, that feasting on this food and drink, our lives may reflect your generosity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most high God, we praise you for all servants of the gospel, for the church throughout the world, including our bishops, Tom and Elizabeth, and all who work with them, and for all who sing the praise and glory of God in our community this morning, churches of every name and of every description praising you remembering what you have done, telling others what you have done. We praise you for that community of faith. May we rest and act in Christ's promise that through that gift of faith, grace, we may all reject the devil, the world, and our own sin, and instead thank you and tell others what you have done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most high God, we praise you for the well-being of creation, for mountains and lakes, for fields and forests, for plants and animals. Lift us up as good stewards to care for the entire earth. Be with those who fight fires, already burning in the western part of our country. Be with those who help 
communities recover from flood and earthquake, which seem to happen all the time. Be with those who respond and with those communities that are affected by nature gone wild. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most high God, we praise you for all nations and their rulers, for aid workers in every country. And God, we pray these up leaders in all those nations and advocates to work for the healing, especially for people in war-torn areas and for peace and equality for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most high God, we lift to you all who cry out in need, the hungry and the poor, the downtrodden and the outcast, the grieving and sick, those afflicted by one another and by the evil in the world, those who mourn, including the McKibben family and the Novak family and others we name in our hearts before you. May all in need of any healing know that you are near and that you hear their cries. Send us with that word of grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most high God, we ask your blessing to be with those who are traveling this day, those who are absent from their homes or from their worship places, those who visit our congregation and those who visit around the country. That God's love lead them in their, do their daily work, their daily vocations, their daily travels. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you hear the prayers of your people even before they are spoken. We commend these and all our prayers to you, trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Christ, our Savior and Lord, who as Jesus among us in the night in which he was betrayed took the bread of the Passover feast, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. That same Christ, who in Jesus in that same night took the cup of the Passover feast, gave thanks, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and now to us, reminding them, reminding us that this is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Christ, we ask that you would bless the grapes for the youngest of our assembly, that they would feel the beginnings of the, the touch of your grace, the flavor, the, the scent, the smell, the, the reality of your love in their lives. May God's Spirit give creative life and breath to the words that Jesus taught us to pray as we prepare our hearts for this feast. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The ushers will invite you forward for communion. Two stations, gluten-free at either station if you need that. Grape juice in the inner ring of each wine tray as well. You are all, remember, welcome here.
as you are able would you rise together with me and then pray with me O oh God in this holy communion you have welcomed us into your presence nourished us with words of mercy and fed us at your table amid the cares of this life strengthen us to love you with all our heart serve our neighbors with a willing spirit and honor the earth you have made through Christ our Lord amen may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in faith toward Christ and in love for one another that we may acknowledge and recognize the act and the love and the grace of God in our lives that we may thank God for that power for that gift for that grace and that we may tell others what God has done live your lives in Christ rooted and built up in him and abound in thanksgiving and the blessing of the Holy Trinity one God be with you and remain with you forever amen go now in peace Go in peace. Christ is sending you. Thanks be to God.